our viewers welcome again to the entrepreneur tv show my name is lucy jeffrey i'm delighted to have you uh we are happy to bring entrepreneur stories and licensed professionals so they can speak to you about the things that you need to know and about themselves and about their businesses and by doing that we tend to learn from each other. At this time, I have a great guest that I want to welcome uh, right away. And the guest that I have is Daryl Shing. And Daryl, once I bring him, you'll be able to tell us a little bit more about himself. Welcome, Daryl, to the show. Thank you, Lucy. I'm really happy to be here. Awesome. I know we've been waiting for a long time to have you. I know you're busy and I'm busy, but I'm happy that you're finally here. Uh, well, you know, it, it has come better late than never, but I'm very, very happy to be here. Awesome. Great. So our viewers who didn't be happy to learn about you and, and just so you know, you'll be the first one who will be talking about the topics that you talk about. We have not interviewing anybody else uh, with those kind of topics. So, but, you know, people say that uh, people uh, do business with people they know, like and trust. So we want you to introduce yourself to our viewers first. Tell us a little bit about yourself before you became an entrepreneur. Sure. Uh, I'm a second generation Canadian. I was born in Canada, went to University of Western Ontario, graduated. My first job was investment banking at RBC Capital Markets. And I discovered pretty quickly that the large business was a bit stifling for somebody like me. When I was trying to innovate creative ideas, go after new clients, I found out this was not the best environment for that. You know, with the big banks, when there's an oligopoly, they tend to just do repeat services and um, they just want to continue to service the larger clients. So when my innovation was stifled, I learned pretty quickly that I wanted to be in an envir a different environment where I could really express my creativity, my innovation, and a lot more of my entrepreneurial spirit of trying to create new business, trying to create new types of revenue. And that's when I discovered my spirit and I discovered that there was probably something better for me out there. That's good. Um, and you, I think we have something in common. I also worked in the banking sector, but not uh, doing exactly what you're doing. But yeah, so sometimes people look at us and wonder, how can you live a very well-paying bi-weekly pay and become an entrepreneur? But you did that, and I know I did that. So tell me then, so you decided to, to own your own business to become an entrepreneur. Tell us a little bit more about that, that, that process. For sure, Lucy. Um... You know, I started at RBC, but I didn't, I wasn't there the whole time. I started going to smaller and smaller investment banks. And I eventually went to a merchant bank where I was doing series A equity financing. And that's, so that's two to $10 million equity raise for a very early stage business that hasn't commercialized yet. And that's when I realized this is the group that needs the most help because these are entrepreneurs that have probably never approached a sophisticated institutional investor. They've never done financial projections. So from my perspective, I said, okay, I left investment banking. I started my own firm primarily for capital raising, which is why Vistance Capital's name came into effect. And it was to help people with business plans, three to five year financial projections and investor presentations, raising series A equity financing. So that's how the business started. Now, why, how do we get into accounting? It morphed because what happened was we were successful in getting term sheets. We were going through due, due diligence. And I watched several of my deals collapse because of poor financial statements during the due diligence process. So I looked into what was going on. And here's what I realized. Most small businesses are set up with a bookkeeper and they, and they have an accountant that shows up once a year to do taxes. But nobody's really asking any questions in between. So what happens is I think a lot of entrepreneurs get a false sense of security saying, well, I've got an accountant that does my taxes. So my financials should be accurate, right? And the reality is they're often not. They often are good enough to pass for CRA for tax purposes that all they care about is your, is your net profit and how much corporate tax that you owe. But when it comes to accurate financial statements with a true gross profit margin, with intangibles, research and development capitalized, shareholder loans and debt, Often what they find during the due diligence process, their financials are not accurate at all. So we actually did a pivot and we realized that there was a really necessary service of getting financials investor ready. 
which is a completely different standard than just good enough for tax purposes. And that was how we pivoted into accounting. Wow, that's great. So, but that could mean that you can also work with bookkeepers and work with accountants and business owners themselves. Uh, I think you can help all these people. Is, this, is it true? That's absolutely correct. We work with businesses that like their bookkeepers and often they just need a little training. So a bookkeeper is not trained to ask a question like, hey, I saw this IT invoice. Is this research and development? So should this be capitalized as an asset on the balance sheet? Often they'll see an IT invoice and they'll punch it in as an expense. Um, a lot of times business owners will use their own personal credit card and pay for a lot of expenses with, with, with personal credit cards, personal bank accounts. Well, a lot of those expenses need to be captured as a shareholder loan because those are expenses that need to be paid back to the business owner. Well, a bookkeeper may not know to ask these questions. So we know the right questions to ask to ensure the financial statements are completely accurate. So we work with other accountants that maybe are not very familiar with the capital raising process, don't know how to do projections. We work with bookkeepers, and we train them to ask certain questions so that they're, they're more effective in their job. So we do a good job working with other people as well, so that they we all reach our ultimate common goals. Awesome. Great, Daryl. Thank you that you help business owners. I'm always happy. You can see the smile on my face when I deal with someone who supports businesses. So from the sound of it, then, it sounds like you work more with incorporated businesses or, or what type of businesses do you work with? Yeah, we, I mean, our most typical client is a corporation that wants to better understand their financial statements. So uh, you know, our typical client is not somebody who comes and says, I just want my taxes filed. So for a lot of CEOs, I think when they look at their financial statement, they understand their, they understand their top line revenue and they know what their net profit is, but they often do not understand everything in between. So when it comes to really understanding what is my gross profit margin by product, by service, by division, if they have multiple divisions, let's really break down my fixed expenses. So I really understand them. And, and by category. So if I know I need to make a cut on 20% of my fixed expenses, I know exactly where to look. When you ask a, a CEO these types of questions, they're not as familiar with that content. And this content is really important, one, to know, in order to maximize profit, where a lot of CEOs are focused on just growing revenue. A lot of times it's easier just to decrease expenses if you want to increase your profit. And the other thing too is, um, you know, there sometimes I work with CEOs that say, well, I can't fathom spending an extra dollar on anything that doesn't generate revenue. And sometimes it takes some convincing. So our best client are those that recognize that it is actually very, very important to understand your financial statements and what benefits those can bring. And those are our best clients. Now, we also have what I call solopreneurs. So let's just say there's contractors that are photographers that are uh, working as doctors that are working in, in, a, in a more, more of a sole capacity. We do work with those clients as well, but the most typical client there is somebody who wants to grow. So let's just say, for example, you're a photographer and you want to grow your business and you want to hire subcontractors. You want to start marketing and branding yourself. We help people through that growth process because as an entrepreneur, I started as a solopreneur. I started as a single contractor, as a CFO, helping businesses raise capital. But what I realized was that working in that way, it was hard for me to grow my business because I'm constantly spending my time fulfilling contracts. I'm not doing business development. I'm not training a team. So a lot of people that want to go through the process of growing and becoming a full business, we do a lot of consulting on that side as well. Awesome. Great to know, Andero. And now you have talked about CFO. So let's talk about CFO work. Uh, when do businesses need to hire a CFO and what exactly is the work of a CFO? So here's the biggest irony of it all. Fortune 500 companies all have CFOs and it's typically the last executive position to get, that gets hired. But arguably it is an early stage company that needs a CFO more than anybody else. Because if you think about what's happening at an early stage as an entrepreneur, you've created a product, maybe you've launched, maybe you've started the process of commercialization. But early in the stage of a business, you are still discovering what works and what doesn't. So a lot of times companies are pivoting their business strategy. They're going from 
B2B to e-commerce. They're launching a second product. They're expanding into a new country. And a lot of this small businesses, and over 90% fail from a startup phase. And it's because they run out of cash. So a lot of companies are making these huge decisions that have massive cash flow implications without the help of financials. And from my perspective, the first, the first uh, responsibility of a CFO is to help an entrepreneur with these really difficult decisions. It's, okay, let's create a budget. Does this decision to expand actually make sense? Let's look at the P&L and see if the gross margins are actually sufficient. Because what happens is a lot of times you can do, end up doing a budget and realize that a lot of these businesses are actually non-starters and you should have never have gone in that direction anyway. So you can prevent a business from making a $500,000 decision and going down the wrong path and trying to enter a business that didn't make sense in the first place. The second benefit of a CFO is just ongoing work in terms of ongoing advice and advisory, because you now have a second set of eyes. You've got a second person to help with these really, really difficult decisions that you have to make alone as a CEO. So when it comes to bouncing ideas off of, you know, should I bring in a new part business partner? Should I be hiring a COO at this point? A lot of these important decisions, a lot of these decisions help with benefit of somebody who has been there before, who's grown a business from five to 10 people to 10 to 50 people and know when to pull the trigger on some of these hires, one of some of these big decisions. So that's really the benefit of a CFO is really help with a second set of eyes, bouncing ideas off of somebody. Awesome. Great. That's really great to know, Daryl. And that's how you help uh, your clients. Uh, but I want them to talk to you about uh, decision making. A lot of business owners are busy making decisions. One, do you help them make decisions? Do they even listen to you anyway? Or they think that they know what they are doing? And what is the best way to remove emotions from business uh, and decision making? Lucy, that's a great question. Um, obviously, I would say that there's a mix. You know, we have clients that don't listen. And in the in the event that they don't listen, a lot, often we'll, we'll have the honest conversation and say, listen, we see that you're going ahead and making decisions with uh, that are contrary to our advice. Do you still want us here? Because at the end of the day, I, I, I'm happy to collect the check, but I want to work with businesses that see the value that we bring, uh, that see the importance of a budgeting process. And then we have clients that understand the importance and see the value that we're bringing and the ex expertise that we're bringing. And in my opinion, a lot of those businesses that see the importance of having finance as part of the decision-making process, they really benefit from that and they avoid making big mistakes. So as part of the budgeting process, we will actually execute a mini p &L or profit and loss statement and project out at least 12 months. And so if you're thinking of expanding into the US, which is a very typical strategy that we look into, we look into the startup costs of the US. Do we need to put boots on the ground? Do we need to set up an office down there? What's the landscape? Yes, it's a much bigger market, but there's also more competition. So does this move make sense? Or are we better off in a less competitive market that may be smaller? Are some of the decisions that we will come to? Now, when it comes to emotion, here's a short answer. We cannot remove emotion from our decision making. Uh, the truth is, we use emotion to make decisions and we use logic to, to justify our decisions. But it is a recognition that maybe this decision is emotional and I need to recognize at least that I'm placing some emotion in this decision-making process. So when you have that recognition, that's when it helps to have the sounding board and say, listen, I've got this big decision I'm making and it could be terminating the employee. It could be, it could be terminating a partnership with a business partner that you've been working with for 10 years. And it's, am I being haste in this decision or is this a decision that makes sense? And this is where a fractional CFO is really helpful because a lot of times a fractional CFO is objective, doesn't really have skin in the game on this particular decision and can make a really impartial objective decision and help you see things in a way that are really objective to help you with that decision process. So it is, that's the real benefit uh, is bringing in somebody who's objective, but also just trying to look at numbers. And this is where finance comes into play is look at numbers before you make decisions because numbers don't lie. When you're looking at a decision process and you see what the profit and loss may look like in scenario A versus scenario B, 
those numbers tell you a story of what can potentially happen with each decision. And looking at those numbers really objectively is quite crucial. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I want then us now to dive into uh, financing small businesses financing what's the trend what's the landscape like now do you find that they are more going to the banks or are they trying uh, to raise capital what are you seeing out there Andero? so i think that everybody goes to their bank first to see if they can get financing now here's the difficult part the bank is probably one of the more difficult are areas to raise financing because banks require hard collateral so if you have real estate or if you have equipment financing, that's much easier to do. But if you are operating a small business and you're trying to, to just get financing based on cash flow when you're not profitable yet, it becomes very, very difficult. So what are your options? Well, BDC is willing to loan at a much earlier stage. That's a business development bank of Canada and they are a federal government entity. They're not a profit maximizing or organization. So they are willing to lend at a much earlier stage but that often comes with personal guarantees and it also comes with high interest rates. So you're looking at 9% or, or double digit fine, uh, per, uh, yield financing, which is expensive for a small business. So for a lot of businesses uh, that are at an early stage, if you have, especially if you've not generated revenue yet or you're under $500,000 of revenue, the only way to raise capital at that stage is through equity. And often that is through high net worth individuals, friends and family for a seed round of capital of up to, let's just say a million dollars or going series A equity financing. So if you have proof of concept and you have a little bit of revenue, you could qualify for series A equity financing, which is two to $10 million being raised through equity investors, which is often venture capital an angel network or private equity if you're bigger. Now, what we are seeing in a landscape that has changed significantly is that through COVID, when there were when there was a spike of business failures, a lot of investors now prefer companies to be further along down the path of proof of concept so that they have a fully developed product that's completed that maybe needs small upgrades and has revenue. And there is no proof of concept like revenue. So for businesses that have been beta testing that have positive feedback, let's just say a software company that is selling a SaaS platform. Well, that's not really proof of concept quite yet because at the end of the day, the question is, are people willing to pay for your product? You may have a lot of people to say they like it and through beta testing, you may have positive feedback, but if you're selling your subscription for $50 a month, do you have people that will actually pay $50 a month for your product? And that question isn't answered until you get people paying so from my perspective, the shift has been to companies that are further along. And yet, yes, granted, the valuation is higher because you have more proof of concept and you have revenue. But I think that you have now a landscape where investors prefer to de-risk and put make and make bets on, you know, more more prudent bets on companies that are more likely to succeed at a little bit of a later stage. So this is not a shift that is helpful for early stage businesses. And it's made the landscape actually more difficult for startups um, and that which is unfortunate and i think you know a trend that we hope changes over time thank you thank you Dero. so i now that you have talked about financing i i've been thinking about so if businesses cannot get financing from the banks and bndc has higher rates and I mean, you're starting a business to try and grow it and you need money to grow that business, right? So what would you talk about grants and sub subsidies from the government? Is that applicable uh, to those businesses then? Absolutely. And, you know, Canada is a great place when it comes to grants and subsidies for innovation. So if you are building something innovative that does not currently exist in the marketplace, uh, there are grants and subsidies available through SHRED and IRAP are the two biggest programs in Canada. And what that requires simply is a scientific write-up with a hypothesis where you are generating a new pr pr product with testing and doing hypotheses to figure out a conclusion about whether you are developing a product that is going to be better than what's currently available in the marketplace. 
Now, there are various grants and subsidies. There are regional grants and subsidies if you live in certain towns and certain regions. There's grants and subsidies if you hire interns. So if you bring on summer students or if you bring on uh, people that are recent graduates from university. But it is really good to have an accountant that is well versed in these areas, and we are. So we make sure that we are constantly up to speed on grants and subsidies that are offered, not just by the federal government, by provincial and regional as well. And have somebody who's proactive and does a lot of research in this space, because this is the way that can that can really get you off the ground in terms of helping you when you struggle to get financing. If you're not, if BDC and all these other loan options are not available to you, then this is definitely a place to look to get you started and at least give you a small fund so that you're able to develop your product. Awesome and great. Uh, so then, Daryl, I wanted to talk to you about, because we have looked at financing, we have looked at the grants, uh, and, and do you help these businesses to do the plans and everything and all those reports that are required? We do most of them. And so for a lot of situations where the grants require financial information, uh, we can provide them. Now, we do not provide uh, the uh, write-up for SHRED, for example, because with SHRED, it requires a scientific write-up with somebody with scientific training. Um, and so often with SHRED, what happens is there are consultants out there that will offer to do the write-up uh, for a success fee. So when it comes to SHRED, we have consultants that will ask for success fee of anywhere between 15 to 20% to do the write-up. So there is no fee up front and there's no fixed costs, but they take a piece of the grant and subsidy if they're successful landing that for you. So that is the most common arrangement when it comes to shred. Uh, but for grants and subsidies that are more simple where they require a business plan, which is more business related business plan, it requires 12 month projections that requires um, accounting information like salaries that were used in, R in the R&D process. We help provide all that information and we do help with the application process. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Dero. So uh, looking at everything, you know, uh, systematically from where we have come from to where we are now, I wanted to ask you, what are the indicators that a business will succeed or fail? It seems like you can project everything. Mm -hmm. The biggest factor for me, and this is underlooked, is the management team. And when I say management team, actually, when it's earlier, it's really looking at the business owners because you can have the best product in the world, but if you have a team that does not know how to execute, that, that idea is not worth anything. Um, from my perspective, if when I look at an investor presentation, I look really carefully at the owners, partners, and management team. So has this person ran a business before? Has this person successfully exited a businesses before? Has this person successfully ran a go-to-market strategy? Building a brand from scratch is not like it used to be. You know, back in the day, if you wanted to uh, do marketing, you could do an ad in a newspaper, radio, or TV, and you would get hundreds of thousands of eyeballs and hundreds of thousands of, of hits because it was a really, there was less mediums competing for, uh, for audience attention. In this new landscape now, especially people launching a brand uh, direct to consumer, it is really much more difficult today because you've got all these different social media applications. You've got Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. Where do you start in terms of uh, of reaching your audience? And I think it takes uh, requires a lot more skill today to figure out a proper branding strategy. And I think more so today than ever before, people invest in people purchase brands. They don't buy products. So when I meet with an entrepreneur who's an engineer and who's created the best product in the world, I say, well, do you know how to actually get into distribution, get into get, uh, develop a go to market strategy to manage a team of 10 people, uh, create an HR process, uh, a management process so that people are motivated and trained and work really well. And those are really the questions you need to be asking a team when they're growing and figuring out whether they're gonna be successful or not. Um, you know, I'm not discounting idea, and I understand that idea is very important, but to me, a mediocre idea that's executed by a very strong team that knows 
how to do all these components. Um, and if you're in manufacturing, I ask the question, do you have experience manufacturing, building a plant, managing costs? If you're do, if you have a wholesale strategy, do you have experience dealing with the Loblaws and Costco's of the world, um, knowing how to negotiate with them, payment terms, um, getting on the shelves, negotiating in-store marketing. So for me, there, there's check boxes, obviously. There is product creation, distribution, marketing, HR, finance. Do they check all those boxes? And if not, what's your plan to check those boxes? Do you recognize that you need to bring in a CFO when you reach a certain threshold? That to me, somebody who understands the growth phase of a business and is the right person at startup, at you know, 10 employees at 50 employees when they get to medium size or the recognition that they need to bring in people at those stages. That to me is a, a, a recipe for a success. Um, and to me, it's the people more than anything else when it comes to running a successful business. Wonderful. So, uh, Ndero, I would like you to speak to um, business owners like me. Um, who don't really understand the financials as much as you do, right? We don't have to be good at everything. So mm -hmm. I would say I'm very good at sales and bringing in business. I've been mm -hmm. having an accountant and a bookkeeper for this number of years. I've been a self-employed entrepreneur for 10 years, owned a corporation for six years. But I feel like numbers are not my area. Right, mm -hmm. and I want to leave somebody else to deal with that. So, is it important for a business owner to understand the numbers and the financials? So, Lucy, I, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs that say exactly what you just said. Listen, I'm not an accountant, so I, I, what do I need to know? And the truth is, the answer that I give is yes. You need to be somewhat familiar with your accounting. Now, do you have to know every line item on your balance sheet, every line item on your profit and loss statement? Not necessarily. So what we do is often we break down a profit and loss statement into 10 lines that are key for a business owner. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. So I have only 30 seconds and I want to appreciate you for joining the Entrepreneur Nation. So tell me, how is it going? And is there anything else that we have left out that you want to talk to uh, our viewers about as we conclude? Well, Lucy, it, being part of the entrepreneur nation, entrepreneur nation has been a fantastic opportunity for me. I've enjoyed joining the monthly calls, meeting a lot of colleagues. You know, when you're a CEO, it is a lonely place. Um, it's a lot of times you can't bounce ideas off of people in the company when you're making important decisions. So being able to meet in a network with other entrepreneurs that are like-minded, going through the same challenges and the same issues is excellent, for, not just for my business, but for my well-being of somebody who has experienced a challenge before, talking to somebody who has made a mistake and can prevent you from making that mistake. So Lucy, I really appreciate the Entrepreneur Nation. I understand, I, I appreciate what you've built, and I think this is a very important network for business owners who want to talk to other business owners and get advice and, you know, even a shoulder to cry on at times. Cause you know, as entrepreneurs, we go through some difficult times. Awesome. Great. And I actually think I, 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 I created it because I need and a shoulder to cry on, right? Because when you're on by yourself, self-employed, you don't have anybody to talk to. So thank you so much for seeing it that way. And Daryl, we appreciate your time. It seems like we'll invite you more and more in case something comes up that uh, you would want to share with the business owners. I'd love to come back, Lucy. I really enjoyed this conversation and we should have another one. Awesome. Great. Our viewers, thank you so much for watching.